My name is Martin Stewart Weeks and I'm the Chair of the Australian Social Innovation Exchange. I'm also on the board of the Centre for Social Innovation and um, occasionally I do some work for Cisco Systems um, who pay my wages um, to do a lot of work in the strategy and innovation space which allows me to uh, play around with these uh, interesting ideas and um, meet and work with very interesting people, one of whom you're going to meet uh, today, at least from this end of the room. Lots of interesting people on the other side of the room too. Um, before we start, I'm going to take a huge risk um, and I'm going to ask everyone in the room to introduce themselves. Now the risk is, of course, that we'll be here till the tea break um, and I'm not going to stand for that. So if it gets really, really, you know, out of hand, I'm just going to uh, tell people to stop talking. So I literally just want a name and an organisation. The reason I'm doing it is for two reasons. One is because it's a kind of polite way to start a meeting. I've, my mother always told me you're supposed to introduce yourself, so we should do that. It means that everyone in the room will have a little bit of an idea of who else is here, and it will be an eclectic group, I'm, I'm sure. But it also will give Dan um, a little bit of a chance to get a sense of the kind of uh, the dots that are in the room that he can uh, uh, begin to join as he goes through. So I'm going to start on the right-hand side of the room because there's two people I happen to know, so you know, I've primed them up to get started. We'll just whiz through each row, so literally, if you wouldn't mind, very, very short and sweet, just a name and an organisation so that we can plot you on the map and uh, we'll see where we go from there. So Steve. Steve Lawrence, Chief Executive, Social Innovation Exchange. Uh, Brenton Clapton, the Australian Centre for Social Innovation. The group. Um, which is good because the quick comment I wanted to make by way of uh, introducing Dan is this notion that increasingly, it seems to me anyway, some of the more interesting um, insights and experience and practice around innovation happens at the intersection of some often unusual and unexpected uh, places. Um, in fact, someone once defined, I don't know whether it was, I read this on the bottom of a calendar one day or somebody gave this to me as a saying that innovation happens at the collision of the unfamiliar. I thought that was kind of a nice and I kind of vaguely keep that uh, in mind. And then when I, uh, as, a, as, my, as a way of introducing Dan, it's kind of a nice way to collect um, some thoughts about somebody whose career has been um, somewhat unfamiliar, I guess, in terms of the spaces in which he's been operating. So um, when I first met Dan, he was working here in Arup. Uh, and I thought, OK, I understand what Arup is, you know, architects and engineers and designers, and that's all fine. And then he was in the kind of strategic foresight piece. And then I found out he had a degree in IT um, and information technology. Then I found out he'd worked for the Manchester City Council um, for a while. And he had a, an interesting and uh, slightly sceptical view about the wonderful world of public policy and public management. So that was good. Uh, then I found out he'd been very active in the team that was the first wave of the BBC's online presence in the UK. And then he'd worked with a few folks to help set up an interesting magazine in the design and ideas space called Monocle. Some people might know that magazine. And I thought, well, so that's an interesting kind of cluster of experience, expertise and perspectives. Um, and all, it seems to me anyway, held together by somebody who brings a kind of very distinctive design ethic to this conversation. And given that there's a room with a nice sprinkling of designers in the room, you can probably tell me more about uh, what that really means. But from my perspective, what it means is somebody who's very comfortable taking an idea or a thing, often a physical thing, but an idea, disassembling it into its component parts on the distinct impression that there's probably a better way of putting it back together again, but we're not quite sure what that is before we start. There's something about the way designers feel comfortable in that world um, and sometimes get it wrong as they prototype their way to something better. Um, rapidly prototyping, I'm told, is a good thing to do. Um, there's something about that ability to live in this profoundly ambiguous, uncomfortable, emergent, um, slightly unknown space um, that maybe is a core to the conversation about innovation generally and about innovation and public design, as I think some people are now beginning to call it uh, as we move into the public policy and government space. So that's probably the, um, the only thing I want to say by way of setting the scene. The rest you'll have to make up uh, for yourselves as you listen to Dan and, and hear what he's got to say. One of the things I know we're going to talk a lot about, and we'll, uh, we'll reference it a fair bit, is this book, um, Recipes for uh, Systemic Change, which is the most recent piece of work that's come out of the Helsinki um, Design Lab, which is where um, Dan is currently based in Finland, in Helsinki, which is a good place to be if it's the capital of Finland, I guess. Um, and there's a very, very rich array of material in that book about very, very practical ways to, if you like, 
get a handle on that ambiguous space that I've just defined. So it's fine to live in ambiguity, it's kind of cool and interesting, and, but actually you've also got to get some work done every now and then. And um, as Peter Drucker once said, one of my favourite management writers, sooner or later he said, all good strategic planning degenerates into the need for hard work. <laughs> just bear that in mind. And I think to myself, sooner or later all design thinking actually degenerates into the need to do something. And you need people who can take all those lovely concepts and all that lovely ambiguity that we swim in and actually get things done in a purposeful fashion. <laughs> this particular tome, and it does have a slight tome feel about it until you start reading it, and it's incredibly accessible and very, very, very well uh, written, um, begins to show how we move from, if you like, ambiguity to something that looks like it's actually getting stuff done and things are happening and things are getting better as a result. So we're going to do um, a fair bit of thinking, I think, around that space. What I'm going to suggest we do, and we've kind of um, roughly got the afternoon in mind, but like all good um, design-focused um, events, we'll make some of this up as we go along. Um, I'm going to let Dan loose on you shortly for around about 40 to 45 minutes. So a reasonable load of data will come your way in the nicest possible way. Lots of pictures, lots of ideas, lots of thoughts, so get your pens out and scribble like mad. I think probably we'll just let that run and not get too many interruptions if we can. Um, I think that's probably the best way. Let's get the story that Dan wants to put in front of us based on this work. Then um, Dan in particular will probably open up the conversation. He'll be very keen, I'm sure, to get some very sort of instant top of mind reactions and then we've got some ideas about how we can take a more structured approach uh, in the rest of the time that we've got available um, to get some conversation a little deeper and a little more granular. We will, as I say, take a break at around about 3.30. Um, sort of a roughly halfway through, but you know, give or take, I'll be the timekeeper. Um, do allow people, as I say, a little bit of uh, flex time and visit the toilet and make a couple of phone calls. There will be some tea and coffee that we can uh, top you up with as we go, and then we will aim to finish pretty much on, on the nail at five, even if, as I suspect is quite likely, the conversations will still be running. Um, we'll have a bit of spillover time for people to keep chatting if they want to, um, and we'll go from there. So, without further ado, let me introduce Dan Hill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Um, thank you for coming. So, and thanks to the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, Social Innovation Exchange, various others whose names I forget because I'm jet lagged. Um, I arrived yesterday, so bear with me. If, I, if at one point in the afternoon I just stop and start staring out of the window, there's someone just come and jolt me and reboot me in some way. Um, I'll try not to do that. Got a cattle prod. <laughs> that, that would be fine. Uh, hopefully we won't need that. Let's see. So as Martin said, um, some of what I'm going to talk about is in this. I always feel a bit like a traveling salesman or something with waving a book in the air. And to reinforce that, if you want to leave a business card or, or scribble your name down somewhere, we can send you a copy. So this um, takes away the traveling salesman bit because we can't charge money for this. We give it away. So. Uh, let me know if you want one afterwards. That's, it'll be kind of a, a vote on my performance, I suppose. <laughs> um, but, uh, we're, a, we're a public body. I should explain where we are and things like this. So, so um, it's nice to be back in Sydney, actually. Um, I, was, I lived here for four years until May when I moved to Helsinki. Uh, this was arriving yesterday. I'm going to be talking about as it says there, Trojan horses, dark matter, things like this, things which hopefully will become clear. It's all to do with thinking about design and government in particular, and I suppose policy and public service and things like that, and the intersection of those two. So I'm particularly pleased to see the balance in the room, actually. One of our things we try and do at Citra is have events which almost the unwritten subtitle of which is government meets design or vice versa and so it occurs to me I could just let you guys talk to each other for three hours and that would be a result as well but I'm not going to do that so uh, anyway so I'm based in Helsinki as I said which looks more like this as opposed to the Anzac Bridge uh, and I work for the Finnish Innovation Fund which is called Citra. Citra is some kind of acronym but I don't understand how that can possibly be an acronym when you see what it spelt out as in Finnish but I understand very little Finnish anyway uh, it was started in 1967. It's an independent fund, but it's sort of public. It's an interesting thing. It was started with an endowment fund granted to Citra by the Finnish nation, by the parliament, 
as a birthday present for the 50th anniversary of Finland's independence. Finland is a new country, only from 1917, essentially, as it existed. And so 50 years in, they give this sum of money to a fund whose job was then to look after the future of Finland, essentially. Uh, it was described quite formally at the times in terms of international competitiveness and things like that. But it did have an interesting uh, little almost like bug in the code that they wrote that underpinned its um, formation. And they said it should use quantitative and qualitative means to ensure that. So that qualitative thing uh, opened a little door for us to jump in in 2008 when we started the strategic design unit there. I say we, I wasn't there, but I joined earlier this year. Um, there are four of us there. Citra is about 115 people. Uh, it's been through several phases. As I said, it started with an endowment fund and originally did um, what you'd call R&D, I suppose, a bit like CSIRO kind of R&D. And then it went on to do venture capital. When there wasn't a venture capital market in Finland, it started doing that, investing in businesses that generated social return as well as financial return. So this was in the 80s, 90s. Uh, when a venture capital market existed in Finland, it stepped out of that. And that's a very secret thing to do, to invest in something, make something happen, then move out when the market or policy space is taking care of it. And now it's in its third phase, if you like, which is delivering projects. Uh, it continues to invest um, in businesses and other ventures that, again, have to generate social, increasingly environmental returns on investment as well as financial. So that's how it raises revenue as well as its endowment also performing or not on the stock market. So it's independent and yet publicly owned. It's under the auspices of parliament but separate to government. So it's in a very interesting in-between space. Uh, it belongs to the nation and yet it can't be controlled by the government. I suppose it's almost akin to the BBC in a sense in Britain in that regard in that the BBC gets its license fee funding from the people of Britain directly, uh, not from the government. So anyway, we'll return to that, I think, about the positioning of it. And one of the things I'd like to talk about later on when we get to discussion is uh, the Australian equivalence of those things, these kinds of bodies, what they could be and what they need to be or what they are if they exist, and I just don't already know about them. Uh, so as Martin said, I, also, I, worked, I used to work at Arup here, who, um, for those of you that don't know, did, did this bit of this photo. <laughs> Not that bit. Uh, you can argue, I suppose, about which is best out of those two bits. But anyway, this, Arup worked on this. Uh, That's where they came to Australia. Again, I suppose, actually, in about the late 60s. And they do many, many more things besides um, big infrastructure projects, the, the Tate Modern, the Channel Tunnel, uh, the Pompidou Centre, um, half of Beijing, that kind of thing. I didn't do any of those things. <laughs> um, as, as Martin said, I was somewhat off to the side of that in a way, um, working with Michelle and Jason, who are over there, uh, as head of foresight for the region, but also running our smart cities work and strategy around that, and also involved in urban policy, urban development projects. So I'll talk a bit about those. But I also was at the BBC, uh, where I was design lead for iPlayer, which I suppose is the equivalent of ABC's, what's it called, iView or something? Oh, yeah. So, and these are these interesting kind of transformational things, irrespective of the content. Um, I think 165 million programs are downloaded a month now on this thing in the UK. So it's, it's transformational in that sense that the media sector often ends up being a transformational sector. But some of the patterns running through this, I would argue, are beginning to transform, obviously, other areas of our lives. And that includes government, public policy, public sector, and so on. So we might unpick a bit of that too. Uh, if you look at a site like this, for instance, this is the Radio 1 site, which I suppose is British for Triple J, as you can tell by the colours, um, if nothing else. Th this section here was SMS messages being texted in by listeners. This was from 2004 or something, 2005. And if you said, the DJ said, you know, text us now, you get about 40,000 texts in about five minutes or so. So you had to build software to aggregate the meaning out of those things, to chuck away the noise if you like, but then the DJ also had to take a call as to what to do with that information. And then you have this interesting mix between a kind of a top-down system of the DJ in the studio and a bottom-up emergent process, which is all the listeners shouting. Um, and the interesting thing is in the middle of those two, and that was what the BBC found interesting at the time, and it continues to drive through the media business, this relationship between emergent bottom-up grassroots activity and then an authorial or top-down 
position. And you can see, again, the analogy probably with the rest of the public sector in general. <coughs> Monocle was interesting in different ways for a whole number of reasons. That's a whole separate talk. But um, one thing was embedding little bits of digital hooks, like that QR code, into physical magazines. So then you have this idea about physical information and digital information being merged, this way in a very literal sense, in a very obvious and slightly now hokey, old-fashioned kind of way. Um, but still interesting in itself in that you can, uh, you can have a physical artifact which has a sort of digital interactions hinted at or suggested or prompted by it. So that, again, starts to be a platform for this top-down bottom-up process and the idea of feedback loops. Now, when people talk feedback loops, they're quite often talking about information systems generating information uh, about the performance of something. But I also look at, if you look around the city, and one thing I like about Helsinki is you see lots of studios and workshops on the street. Um, so you can look through these windows. You can't really see this very well in the photo, but that's Yenna who runs a, a great firm called OK Do in Helsinki, and that's their workspace. It's right there in the window, and there's an, another one and so on. It does occur to me that you can do this in Helsinki because the crime rate is basically non-existent. If you try this in London or Manchester, someone would punch their hand through the glass and grab the MacBook and run probably within about half an hour. But anyway, because it's nice and Nordic and civic, and I'll talk about that, um, you can kind of get away with this. But what I like is that every project I did in Australia, pretty much, I'd, I'd get to a point in saying, now we need to kind of convey the sense of production and creativity by having studios on the streets and you know, make, really make it evident that there's production going on. So there's production at the heart of the city, not just consumption and so on. And then, of course, you go somewhere like that, and there's just a very old-fashioned way of doing it. Uh, it's just by having a glass window with studios, but also uh, a property market which enables that kind of space to be used in that kind of way. So. There's kind of an, a Nike, I like these idea about feedback loops, that this studio here, which is actually on the street I live in, is you know, occupied a lot of the time and active in some sense, but there's this, the, the street going past, and there's this nice interplay between those two layers. Not that you can see much interplay here. Come on. There we go. There's some interplay. <laughs> So feedback loops then, uh, we started scaling up at Arab to the idea of civic feedback loops. And that came into projects like the cloud in London, which was um, a failed project. Lots of the projects I talk about are failures. <coughs> Read into that what you will. I think that's a sign of some kind of success in a weird way. <laughs> uh, in the, uh, the ideas are the easy bit, in a way. And you can, it's easy to generate 100 ideas. And I'll show you probably about 100 ideas. And then if five of them get up, that's actually quite good, in a way because uh, it means the five are better in some senses, or they're more meaningful, or you've had more motivation to drive them through. This one didn't get up because it's basically an insane kind of floating bubble structure hovering above the Olympic Stadium. And why would you build such a thing? But we thought it was a good idea. Um, the, the mayor actually liked it as well. It's Boris. It was Boris's favorite. Um, but it came in second because the engineering apparently wasn't good enough, which is kind of ironic because it was Arab with the partners on it. <laughs> but uh, I wasn't working on that bit. And um, it was entirely possible to build it, apparently. This, this is the same stuff that the uh, water cube in Beijing is made out of, and I guess bits of the rectangular stadium in Melbourne, the soccer stadium there, ETFE. You can uh, then embed LEDs in that so that it becomes a big lighting display, essentially. You can run 3D video broadcasts on it of the 100-meter Olympics going on in the stadium below. But it could also be, what we liked about it was this kind of idea of a smart meter, like but a civic scale smart meter. So actually broadcasting London's performance in some way. So the energy consumption of London would mean this thing would start glowing red or something. Or the, if the transit network was about to melt down, it would start glowing red again. <laughs> and other colors, hopefully, too. <laughs> um, as well as other more complex visualizations you could carry all of that. Google were a partner on it. If you imagine the data that Google has about London, that's very interesting. Like what's being emailed in and out of London over Gmail would just be an incredibly rich piece of cultural information, which you'd have to filter to some degree. Uh, but what London's searching for right now would also be very interesting. And you get the pattern of the day across that, what it's connected to globally, other patterns of data from different cities coming in and out. Barangaroo here in Sydney, the same kind of ideas around energy consumption. These are sketches from the competition stage that we worked on with Roger Sturk Harbour, who are now designing building the thing. Uh, as far as I'm aware, I should check in with the local Sydney politics every time I show these slides to see the current state of play on Barangaroo. Um, but the ideas here were that, the again, the urban environment would be kind of reactive or responsive in some way, that you wouldn't have this 
environment which was set in stone and didn't react to the patterns moving through it, which were increasingly being played out in data, but could also be physical things as well. So ferries coming in, I know that's not a ferry, but ferries coming in would actually cause these bits of landscape architecture to ripple or, or blink in sequence indicate about two minutes beforehand, indicating that it was about to arrive. There was some kind of event happening at this point, which you'd soon be able to read as a sort of real-time timetable. Um, the, the old, is this still here by the way? I hope it is. Anyway. The industrial observation tower basically, which keep, people keep wanting to pull down and I keep trying to find reasons to leave it back up. Recasting that as a smart meter for the collective behavior of Barangaroo. So it would be, again, positive, minus, green, red, whatever. The, it doesn't really matter in a way what the data visualization would be, but the idea that the urban environment would respond in some way. At UTS, a project with Super Colossal, an architecture firm here in Sydney, uh, based around the idea of the campus performing in real time, again, the data being played out on the thing, telling you what the place was about, enabling you to respond to that. Sydney Metro, which I worked on with Jason over there, um, and these are his <laughs> sketches. Are these yours or mine? I can't remember. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, so. So these were ideas for real-time data visualization in station environments. So it would be kind of interactive public art um, on the one hand, and yet also usable interface on the other. So it would have the bus, the train, the ferry, the metro system all working together, as well as presumably car traffic, bike traffic, pedestrian levels, all kinds of things. So you get this kind of organic moving real-time <coughs> movement, which Jason has some nice visualizations of. In doing that, interestingly, of course, you start realizing, well, why, don't we have, why isn't all that timetable data combined anyway? And of course, you realize, well, it's because they've eventually, essentially being run as individual businesses, Sydney ferries, Sydney buses. They're all separate franchises to different operators, and they come from a political culture of maximizing return from those things rather than necessarily looking at um, the operational benefits now to a user environment that expect data to be combined rather than separated. One point you could have got away with that, now you can't get away with that. And this was very clear when we started pulling these things together, the unified views of transit network data across the city. So from there you actually get into, well, then you need Sydney Transport, or you need something like that, and then you come up with a unified identity for that, and a unified strategy for that, and so on. And So that was very interesting, because you start with a, a product in a station, and then you end up actually rethinking the organization of the government around that activity. In Melbourne, uh, this is one of Jason's uh, public data installations showing, what, again, what's going on within the city, but situated in the middle of the city. Um, basically responsive bike garages telling you how, how many bikes are available or not, or real-time transit data deployed into the city, not just at bus stops or not just on phones, all these kinds of ideas. So all of that stuff I do is basically as way as a background. That was before. Um, but it sets up some core ideas that interactive platforms are essentially out of control, but they are systems nonetheless that you have to work with and deploy. So back to Martin's very good introduction, I think, and I curse him, I should have just let him talk for an hour. Uh, this comfort with ambiguity and things being slightly out of control is a reality across most of the systems that people are now running their life by. Maybe it always was, but it's clearly the internet it's clear that the internet has changed the way those systems work and therefore changed the kind of ideas that people have about systems in general. They expect a far higher level of responsiveness and personal involvement. And yet, I'd argue, they're also comfortable occasionally with things not break, breaking down or being ambiguous in some way. Not in all instances. You wouldn't want that happening in a hospital. You wouldn't want that happening on transit necessarily. But there's, a, there's an experimental nature to those systems which people also expect. It goes along with Facebook, for instance, that it's a constantly iterating thing, and therefore it's always in beta in the language of that community. The top-down and bottom-up. So there's an emergent kind of bottom-up process, but there's also a top-down strategic authorial voice going on there too. They're creating participative responsive environments. So again, they're not static responses. They're, they're not static environments. They're not just things that you create and then move on to the next one. You're actually looking for movement across those, for things to be replicated from one to another, and for those things to be responsive in some way. 
And there's this idea about prototyping or delivering projects in order to ask questions in the first place. So a lot of the things that I showed you that I said didn't get up, some of them did, some of them didn't, are uh, because they were designed to ask a question. So Sydney Metro actually didn't work, as we all know, probably. This is from Sydney. And yet, uh, I take huge value from the questions that were asked strategically in the course of that project. It was a very expensive way to get to those questions. But nonetheless, that was uh, an example of design's ability really to focus on questions rather than answers. So as Cedric Price, the British architect from the 60s, put in the 60s, uh, at, the, at the height of the kind of Harold Wilson's white heat of technology sort of uh, verbiage, Technology is the answer, but what was the question? And this is this key thing. Quite often we find ourselves in projects that the, the wrong question has been asked. I'd argue, actually, now I'm not working on the project, I can maybe say this, but Barangaroo is the wrong question. The way the project's been framed is incorrect. And so within that, you've actually, you're kind of working within a very narrow space already. There are a million other ways to look at that bit of the city and make it work for the city. And it's not that the design team isn't doing a good job within the current framework, it is. It's just that there are other questions that could be asked around it. But it's very difficult to swim upstream now. Richard Rogers, who's a Pritzker Prize-winning architect, probably prop top of his game, probably has less agency to ask questions on that project than a middle-ranking Lend-Lease accountant because of the way that value works within a business like the built environment because of the way projects work. You cannot swim back upstream and ask the original questions once you're halfway into it. So it's fundamentally important to get the question right in the first place before you've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on something. You could say the same about Sydney Metro as well. Because <coughs> these, are, these are difficult things. <laughs> Anything involving physical matter is very difficult. So a lot of that project was. Uh, they didn't work, as I said. This one came second. This one possibly happening. I think it probably is, but I don't really know. This one was unsuccessful in a competition. This one got cancelled for um, all number of reasons. And this one's been scaled down, and there's some small stuff happening, but it's not the same level uh, that we anticipated. So that's the reality of working in that kind of space, the difficult. And, and I, know that I got very interested in this idea about, well, how do you actually design the conditions around a project to enable it to work better? Because all the reasons actually why they didn't get up weren't because the ideas were bad necessarily. I'm sure some of them were. The giant floating bubble thing seems a bit silly in retrospect. But it wasn't that the ideas were necessarily bad. That wasn't the reason they didn't work. There were other reasons. They were organizational, political, cultural, to business models, politics, political capital, all of those kinds of things. So we describe this about physical matter, the stuff that you're building. And it doesn't matter actually what it is, because almost everything we do involves matter at some point. And then the meta, which is the space around that, the organizational, the cultural, the leg legislative, the what you call the path dependency, which is the, the culture that something is working within, um, is dependent on the previous version of that culture to some degree. This idea of zooming backwards and forwards between matter and meta is what I'll talk about now. So the State Library of Queensland, another Australian project. I will get to Finland soon. Uh, we were working on the library there, which is a fabulous library, and the Wi-Fi that's gone in there, um, as an afterthought, I have to say, has transformed the space in the, this library. So this is on the river, and the library's in use about 23 hours out of 24 every day, as a, now as a result of the Wi-Fi. So the people there at midnight, one in the morning. This has taken about 11 o'clock at night. This has taken about 5 o'clock in the morning. Um, people using the Wi-Fi all the time. And the library hadn't anticipated that, and it's actually quite fundamentally changed the way they think about what a library is. And we were then called in to help them understand that. What's actually going on here is such that this public space has become vibrant, safe, all of the things that happen when you get people together in the same place physically, even in an urban environment. You're always trying to get at this from when you're doing urban design or urban planning. And, uh, it's very difficult to get a place accessible. And it turned out, in this case, it was actually turning on some Wi-Fi made the difference, which wouldn't have traditionally come from an urban design or an urban planning context. So we'd, this kind of activity where you see, say, three girls looking at a laptop sharing something or other um, wouldn't have been suggested by the urban planning or the urban design context. It came out of actually Wi-Fi, which is slightly left field. But equally, it throws all kinds of interesting questions about, well, what are they doing? <laughs> what are they actually using? Are they, are, they, are they looking at Facebook? Or are they looking at 
maybe they're looking at Photoshop. Maybe they're actually working on the Human Genome Project. I don't know. <laughs> it's probably Facebook. But, you know, <laughs> maybe it isn't. And when we looked there, we found all kinds of interesting stories about software engineers using it to work from, legal consultants working it to use from, interesting interplays and overlaps and so on. So we started looking at understanding that in more detail. And one of the things you can do is to build a map of the, uh, the way the Wi-Fi works on the space. So we measured the signal strength of the Wi-Fi in the building and built a 3D model where a peak in this model is just a, a high reading of signal strength. It's like five bars on your Wi-Fi. And then it, where it drops out is a trough is where there's no bars on the Wi-Fi. It's where it doesn't spread across the building at all. And then we mapped it onto the physical space here, so you can actually see areas where it drops out altogether, like the cafe, which wasn't good, because they would have thought the cafe would be a good place for people to use Wi-Fi, but it turned out that's why people weren't sitting there. And when you got a peak, like in that corner there, it was actually, they, they had no idea why people were sitting there. And it turned out that it was the Wi-Fi. So this is, this is completely invisible. This is what the Wi-Fi would look like if you could see it as a physical structure, if you could kind of see that bit of the radio frequency spectrum. And it enabled the library to think of itself in a new way. We then went on to do all kinds of strategic work on what the library is in 2010 to 2020 and things like that. The other things you can do with the data is look through it and see the patterns within it. So all of this stuff is where, um, where are the pages that people are looking at using the Wi-Fi? So what is that library connected to informationally across the world? And it turns out that's a very interesting pattern showing a lot of Southeast Asian usage in particular. So it tells a story about Brisbane connected to Southeast Asia in a way that, again, was a different narrative for the library to think about. And we thought about putting that back in the space as a feedback loop and so on. So all of these things then lead to another project, The Edge, which is a digital culture center for young people. And the library called us in because they didn't really know what a digital culture center for young people was, but they had to do it. So we explained what a digital culture center for young people was by writing a report about digital culture and kind of fleshing it out a bit. And, Brackets probably telling them a bit about what young people are as well. But anyway, um, like I'm the person to tell them about that. But anyway, that's another story. So we went through this and kind of unpacked the strategy a bit and then took that into the built design of the building and worked with Architects M3 very carefully, thought about what the coffee should, should be like. Should there be uniforms on the staff? Should the building broadcast itself in real time? What if you made the furniture um, carry sensors so that it could tell the story of the way that the furniture was being dragged around the building and so on? One thing we did was make a fake um, brochure or leaflet, the kind of thing that if you're in a, a bar in the valley in Brisbane, you'd pick up explaining what the edge was. And we did this a year before it was built or launched. And uh, it looks like this. And it was full of all of these kinds of events. And all of this is just made up. This is completely fictional, but it was plausible enough to actually help the client understand what it could be. And so they're able to look at things like, oh, a video game tournament on the roof, that's interesting. So now we need to think about the roof security or PowerPoints outside. And if we have bars, if we have, I don't know, bands playing, then maybe we need a drinks license or we need a different kind of staff and so on. So it was actually, it was a way of using design to prototype a bit of the future that helped them now figure out their strategy, which was another interesting trick that we hadn't thought we'd be doing on the project. But when you get into this space that is between the matter and the meta, if you like, the organization and the building, you end, up, you end up having to fabricate things which help people understand that. And if you don't do that, that often, sh that often I'd say, is the, the big gap you see between policy and delivery, or the, the idea and then something being carried out and not well executed, because that join hasn't been made. So part of this is about being convincing. And for a government, uh, organization of the state government in Queensland where it's with a digital culture center for young people, being convincing is super important. It's, it just will not work if it feels, with all due respect, like a government institution because that's not the target audience they were going for and it's not the kind of atmosphere they wanted to create. So, but part of it also is designing the context around something. So not just the thing itself, not just the building, but what kind of organization is going to make this building work? Because building is basically just a pile of bricks or concrete or steel or timber or whatever. It's the organization actually that moves into it and the, the users that move into it that will then decide the success of the thing. Now, that is often not thought about at the design stage. In fact, hardly ever thought about at the design stage. But that's the thing that makes the difference. So how do we start joining these things together? leads us to this idea of strategic design now. So strategic design, as practiced by us in Helsinki, you can find out more about by going to helsinkidesignlab.org. 
Um, but I'll, I'm going to run through it a bit now, obviously. Now, here we're seeing that if we think about design challenge, you know, your usual design challenge you might hear about is the recyclable toothbrush or, you know, the, the car that works on electricity or a sustainable urban development or, you know, next year's clothing collection for so and so. The, the design challenge that we're looking at is actually the public sector and civic life. So full marks for arrogance and hubris right away. <laughs> uh, but, you know, what are you going to do? So, but we see this now is fundamental because uh, a it's too important to fail and secondly there's not enough people looking at this within design itself so i think actually as a designer uh, it's a challenge to the design industry those of us in the room who are designers to frankly do something a bit more meaningful now that can sound harsh but if we spend all of our time delivering products and services and basically the end process of things then that's okay, but we are missing the point about the questions, the strategy, the context upstream, where I think design can actually have a lot of value, and we'll talk about that. So irrespective of getting uh, kind of high-handed about whether it's socially meaningful or not, I think it's actually not the best use of design just to focus on the delivery end of things. And this is the point. Can we get design into a position where it's more meaningful? So kind of things that we're talking about when we say the design challenge are these, I've graded them out because you all know the list actually. <laughs> Complex problems, climate change and sustainability, healthcare, education, fiscal policy, debt crises for instance, uh, economic development, social services, aging population, all of these what some people call wicked problems but I don't because it would sound like Ali G. Uh, then the, these complex problems that are just so very different now. They're interdependent, interlinked. Everything is connected to everything else. Health cannot be addressed by the Department of Health <laughs> alone. It also is the Department of Education. It's also the Department of Urban Planning. It's also the Department of Economic Development. All of those things have an impact on health. Okay? So how, does that how is that going to work when all of those things are in separate departments with different cultures and actually incentivized not necessarily even to talk to each other? So. How do we unpick these interdependent problems whereby the volcano in Iceland last year put out of production three BMW power plants in Germany? Or you know, the Brisbane floods shut down virtually Queensland with massive economic um, problems for months to follow. Uh, that sort of interconnected complex world that some people say is almost out of control now, is certainly beyond our decision-making culture, our institutional culture. Partly because the problems aren't clear, so we can't decide even what the problems are here sometimes. This is a classic thing around carbon, sustainability. We haven't decided yet on what the problem is or how to address it. We kind of know that it's deeply serious and it's the end of the human race. And yet, <laughs> we haven't quite got figured out the right question. Uh, there isn't a client, so e.g. climate change. There's no client for climate change except maybe the human race, but there's no one you can really go to to address that problem at quite a high level. Uh, equally, there's sometimes too many clients. So again, health is the province of all of those departments I mentioned before, and all of us as individuals, and all of the private sector, and so on. The problems are interdependent, as I said. Uh, it's beyond existing policy and process improvements. So a challenge to service designers in the room. Quite often when we're doing service design, we're working for a client within a context and you can do process improvement within that context. You can make things better, no doubt. But actually, what if the real gains are outside of that client relationship, to the left or to the right or in another space? That's really difficult to do. So one of our, one of our colleagues in Copenhagen, uh, MindLab, who are a design agency w working within the Danish government, they work within three ministries there as designers, service designers. It's a fascinating um, example of design in government, and it works really well, and yet they are, they are still essentially working for those three ministries as clients, and so it's very difficult to get into the other ministries or step out of the ministries together and suggest, actually, that ministry shouldn't exist. It's very difficult to say that when they're your client, right? So you've got to free yourself of that process improvement thought and think about strategic improvement. The uh, problems are also to do with public return on investment or shared value in um, Michael Porter's terminology. Again, we don't have a good idea about that. How do you measure things like social return on investment? It's just really, really, really complex, particularly if you're looking through an existing paradigm of the last couple of hundred years' worth, almost, of thinking. And you get this enormous gap between policy and delivery. So um, we've been working with the UK government a bit recently, actually, just in an advisory role, just sort of on the side, as it were. 
just for fun, basically. <laughs> um, but one of the things they're dealing with there is the problem between policy and delivery, this enormous gap where policymakers come up with policy and then they're entirely divorced essentially from the delivery of something. So they don't really know actually how that carries through into the reality of a job center or a hospital or, or even an economic development context, which is even more difficult to measure. And yet they have to develop policy there without those feedback loops. Equally, delivery has to decide what to do and there isn't a clear link to policy. There isn't a clear link that enables the design intent, if you like, the vision to be carried through all the way. There's just two different worlds. And so there's a very good paper of making policy better, I think it's called, by the Institute for Government in the UK, which talks about how to connect this a bit. But it's, I'd say it's from within that political culture a bit, so I'd look at it with that in mind. But uh, it talks about system stewardship. And so your idea is you know, you're responsible for delivering outcomes within a system, and you're a steward of, of all of those outcomes. There's no detail on how to do that. And when you talk to civil servants in the UK, they sort of come to the side of the, of the room after the session and go, I really don't know what the system stewardship thing's about. I don't have the skills, you know, and so, which is true. So this is a massive problem within the way we've set up our, the, one of the core institutions which governs our life. And then finally, I'd say this diminishing faith in capacity to, for delivery at all. So there's a very powerful report by the... Um, I think it's the International Labour Organization, or the World of Work, which is based on Gallup World Poll data, which talks about plummeting faith in national governments um, and their ability to make a difference or deliver. And it's not just the, the so-called advanced economies, the faith has gone down the most. <laughs> this is in the last 10 years, before the Eurozone debt crisis. Uh, but it, second to that is East Asia and Southeast Asia. So you can't even make the clear link between, say, um, economic performance and then you'd think, oh, maybe there's a faith in governments if you've got strong economic performance. It's not, that's not clear as well, because the faith that they can deliver is going down in that context as well. It's only sub-Saharan Africa where there's an uptick in faith in governmental performance to deliver, funnily enough. Possibly because they're working off a low base, as they say, in policy circles. But So there's that problem. And then there's another nasty graph about increase in likelihood of social unrest, which l runs alongside. So when you have that diminishing faith in a capacity for delivery, you get this kind of thing, which we've seen for the last year. If I just think about the last year alone, then Athens has been like this for a lot of the last year. And we all know that's to do with the austerity measures being trying to be maneuvered through, which is to do with the debt crisis, which is to do with being tied to the euro, which is to do with the, you know, the story. And then also we can look at London uh, back in June, July, July, I think. <coughs> and Manchester and Bristol and Birmingham. This was shocking. I mean, I'd never seen this in my lifetime in the UK. And I don't think actually anybody had seen this kind of thing on this scale. In the early 80s, there'd been social unrest around the miners' strike on a major scale, but not in the way that this was out of control. That was very focused. And there was a, there was a very clear ideological issue at the heart of the miners' strike and the process around it. This was seemed something else. The endless argument about what this was about, even, it wasn't very clear. But you can you can certainly read it as <laughs> you can certainly read it as a protest. You can certainly read it about a, a, a diminished social contract. If we think about the social contract, which is the individual's relationship with a government, that has shredded in the UK in the summer. And then we look at the Occupy movement, which is currently occupying various bits of the world at the moment. Wall Street, most famously, Oakland, most vividly recently. I'd say this is Occupy Rome, actually. Um, in Helsinki, it was funny, there was a very peaceful protest of about 150 people kind of gently waving a placard <laughs> saying, saying uh, down with this sort of thing, as they said on Father Ted. But um, <laughs> uh, in Rome, it just kicks off instantly, which is, you know, it sort of goes straight into this. But anyway, so the, but the Occupy movement around the world, again, you can read as uh, almost a non-specific but nonetheless incredibly visceral feeling of a, a lack of faith in the system. Let's just call it the system for the sake of argument. So, so I don't know the answer to this question. <laughs> Before you hope there's no answer on the next slide. Uh, I think, however, it's partly to do with what I'd call design decisions. Now, it seems funny to use that language, but if we use design broadly as basically the way that we have decided to arrange the world and its various affordances and capabilities, then there's an institutional breakdown there. Um, 
as my boss Marco says, we essentially have 18th century institutions facing 21st century problems, by which he means that government, the academy, a lot of elements of trade and industry were largely set up in a post-enlightenment, let's say 17th, 18th, 19th, thereabouts century context. And those same institutions culturally, because to quote another Peter Drucker thing, seeing as you started it, Martin, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So culture is the most important thing. The same institutions culturally, sometimes structurally, are now facing these complex interdependent problems that are totally different to the ones that the, they were looking at in the 18th, 19th century, when things were still actually, frankly, very local. For all of the talk about global trade and culture at the time, still a local context. So you could have a national government, and they emerge at that time national identity, all of those things. Uh, government, as we understand it currently, the dem democratic process is enshrined in government, emerges from that time more or less. Uh, the academy, universities, the idea of disciplines, of a department of within a faculty of, are range still at that time, essentially. And we now know that the world of work and life is so radically different to that, and yet we still have a department of within a faculty of. And actually, some of them are very similar. If you look at Cambridge, it's largely the same. Not that Cambridge is archetypal, but you know what I mean. So, so this is a this is when we say there's a lack of faith in the system. I think it's partly to do with this. Again, as a designer, I look at the system as it's enacted, and we can see there's a problem there. We can't see what the answer is. We haven't even really phrased the question, but we're seeing the tension, the stress fractures in it, in Athens, in London, across the world, in the Occupy movement, and so on. The Eurozone debt crisis right now, most clearly of all. So some of the techniques, and these now seem very banal, having elevated that problem to the biggest problem in the world. <laughs> um, but uh, again, things have to come down to hard work eventually. So one of our approaches is, how do you start to flush out the right questions in the first place? And here we talk about a technique called the studio. And that's largely what this entire book is about. So I can't do justice to that idea. But the design studio approach talks about the studio as a kind of a space a context and a group. And we talk about sketching the architecture of the problem. Because you can't get to the architecture of the solution until you understand the architecture of the problem. So the way the problem actually fits together. Again, if you look at education, what does education, how does it actually fit together as it's actually lived and experienced? What does that mean? You can't, again, go to the Department of Education and say, give us a map of that, because they just look at it from that instance of the Department of Education, their world view, which is very rich and sophisticated, but isn't the same thing. So the studio is about sketching the architecture. We start off with a brief for something, which takes about six months to write. I was involved a bit in this one. So this was about how can you get Finland to a zero carbon country? Because it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's quite possible in Finland because of the large carbon sink of the forests that are there. It would be possible in Australia, too, in a similar way. But that's, no one talks about that. Um, so, so we're trying to set up the right question there as well. We talk about the space that uh, the studio is delivered in. And this is something, again, you don't often hear when people come and do, particularly consultancy around change management and stuff. Uh, they usually have to work in a space like this, or in a similar kind of space. And they just make it work in this space. But they haven't designed the space to actually make decisions in. And if you think about a culture of decision making, what that would mean, then are there some spaces that are maybe better for making decisions in than others? Quite probably, there are better spaces for doing lots of different things. <laughs> a kitchen is designed for this, and a living room is designed for that, and a swimming pool is designed for this, and a football stadium is designed for that. And th so they're designed for particular functions, but we don't often think about decision making as a thing and then design a space for it. So we, we took that apart a bit and thought, well, how can you make a space that is multifunctional, that enables that kind of big table shared environment, but then also this sort of presentation format, but then also round things where you've got a kind of kitchen on, on hand if you need it and you've got little spaces here to break out and you've got, you know, what, what would that mean? Again, not, not giving you the answer here because it'll be different in different contexts because each culture of decision making is different. But just hold that thought a bit in your heads if you like. And then the team, how do you bring people together? So we, we talked about a multidisciplinary team of eight people brought from all over the world two of which are usually designers or thereabouts, but the other six are content experts and things. And that's a, that's a body purpose built, designed to make quick decisions on things after gathering lots of data. And I'll come back to that process called synthesis, really. Uh, and there are particular characteristics you want in that kind of team. Again, it's sort of, you know, you don't just pick eight random people and put them together and expect them to be able to do something incredible or not. You know, so it's how would you 
and they design the team. We then do a series of site visits. This is basically qualitative and quantitative input. So when we were doing the carbon neutrality thing, we actually went out to a kindergarten on the edge of Helsinki where the kids spend all day outdoors. Even when it's minus 12, minus 15, they're outdoors the whole time. They have the lessons out there, they eat out there, and it's, they're warm because they've got proper clothes on. Because as they say there, there's no such thing as bad weather. There's only inappropriate clothing. So mm -hmm. you can still make that work, and they're active and lively. But that was just a very interesting, very subtle point about how do you create a, um, a culture which understands the relationship between community and natural environment in a quite a very natural instinctive way. If you grow up like this, what a difference that would make. And compared certainly to kids in kindergarten here, which is an incredible climate, where you spend a lot of time indoors. So is that, what, what, does, what difference would that make if you actually went into it with that? That was, I suppose, the subtle question behind that. But we also saw the city planning committee, and you get that very different view on things as well. Uh, then you spend about three or four days sketching. By sketching, I mean working out hunches and, and kind of half thought, as, as Martin said, a kind of ambiguity, kind of wallowing in that complexity and ambiguity, um, rejoicing in the blank canvas, the blank piece of paper, essentially. And then we come down to synthesizing things. So this is this point about synthesis over analysis. If we look again at that, the, almost the, uh, the world, the system, as I put it, certainly around education, it, it sort of prefaces, it, pre it, it preferences, sorry, analysis. So you get analysts, and you don't get uh, synthesists, or synthesizers, as I wanted to call them once. <laughs> uh, you get people that are very comfortable giving you a very clear answer to a very clear question or a very specific thing, but you don't get people so much that can bring things together from different domain disciplines. And as Martin said, actually, the interesting stuff is often on the intersection of two boundaries or pulling different types of people together and enabling that synthesis to happen. But synthesis also suggests pulling things together to make something, to produce something. So actually, suggesting something is important too. Analysis doesn't give you, analysis tells you the why things are the way they are to some degree but they don't suggest the way things could be. And that's where synthesis is different. We then do a presentation, uh, which is kind of formal to bigwigs, and it looks a bit like that. But then in the same space, you take the table and make it a long table, and then you have dinner with the same people in the same space talking about the same thing. And you would not believe the way that those two conversations are different. The presentation and then the formal response, and it's kind of oh, very nice, and I considered this, and this is a very good idea, and I'll take that on board. And then over dinner, and after a couple of glasses of wine, mm -hmm. very, very different. Uh, and the two go together, though, in a very, very rich way. So, so again, using the studio space and all of these different modes can help with that. And what that's about is a kind of rapid prototyping of vision. So I did use that phrase, Martin, you're right but also culture, because it looks at the culture of getting things done. And again, in the book, there's, um, there's all of the output of those, those three studios. The other two are on um, aging and uh, education. So complex problems. And the policymakers we got to present to at the end were very impressed, I should say, in short, with what came out. I won't read this full quote, but this is from one of the people there who talked about suddenly the conversation was different. We were talking about agility and constructive suggestion. Even though things were sketchy and incomplete, the terrain had shifted. So not really about kind of these knotty problem spaces with rigorous analysis for peppered reasons to say no, but kind of balanced portfolios of practical, imaginative, convincing proposals. And one guy in particular said from the education department's point of view, you somehow in a week you got to the point that's taken us two years to get through from a, their traditional str strategic process. So. So, so far, so good. I think that's quite good in a way, and I'll come to the problem with that. <coughs> the positioning of this is really key, though. So, to come back to this point about Citra, Citra's position here, sorry, here, is really key, because often when you're working in a consultancy mode, and the people in the room might recognize this, when you're in a studio or when you're uh, practice from outside proposing ideas, they can just kind of bounce off. We call this kind of the shields of steel situation where you know, you're coming up with ideas and just the exterior skin of the culture of the organization. It needn't be government. It could be anything. It just rejects it for all number of reasons. It just doesn't break through that membrane. Equally, you can fire solutions between the cracks in that thing. You know, it might be, again, that you're pitching something at the Department of Health, and actually it'd be better off in education. And you just don't know that, because you can't read the organization from the outside like that. So Citra's position inside, essentially, public 
administration, public life and government is absolutely crucial. It enables an idea to be pitched within an environment that's receptive to it that, that can then be bounced around in a safe place. So Citra becomes like an R&D for the government, a trusted space to explore these kinds of ideas. It's very, very different. And then we might want to talk later about what, in the Australian context, that is or could be. So the book is a summation of that approach. There's this little movie, which I'll just play you, which describes that a little bit, which we made um, as a web page as well, which goes into all of this stuff. That's Helsinki, by the way, because you didn't know. We're still working on the music. <laughs> we are designers, not musicians. <laughs> So this holistic point is key, as you'll see, but um, essentially we, we like the idea of creating a kind of a how-to manual. We're kind of obsessed with like, instruction manuals, like, I don't know if you have the Haynes books here, but, you know, sort of like an, the Nissan 370Z kind of stripped apart with how to put it back together again, to your point. So how do you do that around these kinds of problems? That's all in there. What that doesn't do is tell you then how to get those things out of the sketch and the vision into delivery. So that's what we'll talk about now. So these are ideas around prototyping. How do, you, how do you deliver something? And I'm going to talk about one of our projects, Low to No, which is an urban development project. It's about low carbon to no carbon, hence the name. So it describes a transitional strategy from, it doesn't try and claim to be zero carbon straight away, as certain other projects might. <laughs> uh, but it starts low and then can get to no. And it's here. And <laughs> Uh, this just looks very unforgiving at the moment. This is a kind of former harbour area in Helsinki, which is coming for grabs, and it'll hopefully will look a bit more like this in 2014 or thereabouts, 2015. And uh, specifically, I want to talk about everything but the building, actually. The building for us is actually a mere detail. It's a very expensive detail in that sense, um, as buildings always are, but that's not why we're doing it. The building is intended to deliver a series of strategies around systemic change. So it's a sense uh, a Trojan horse kind of approach. So throughout this presentation, I'll talk about vocabulary a bit, and I'll, and I'll suggest a few words and concepts. Um, because to Martin's point, again, about getting this less ambiguous, uh, vocabulary sometimes helps. So the vocabulary will seem a bit hokey and a bit dumb at times, but that's me. Um, but bear with me, it's the, the Trojan horse idea, I hope everybody will understand, is a way of sneaking a bunch of different strategies into something that looks like a building in this case. So one of those is timber. Now the whole building, at least our bit of it, the Citra HQ, which will be part of this neighborhood block, which also has about 150 apartments in it and commercial space and retail and so on, will be made of timber fully. So 11 stories, 12 stories of timber using a new timber technology called compressed laminate, which basically is super dense. And so it doesn't burn, it just chars. You can build the whole thing from it. You don't need concrete or steel or anything. So the structural elements are timber. The inside is timber and so on. So timber is very nice because it locks up carbon. It's a carbon sink, essentially. It locks up for a very long time, as opposed to concrete and steel, which are very carbon intensive. Uh, it's aesthetically pleasing and so on. These are sketches for how bits of a hallway might look inside the building. It's also really good for Finland. <laughs> Finland's about 85% forests and has a big forestry business, which has been largely oriented towards paper and pulp production for many years. Now, that paper and pulp business is heading south to Malaysia, Indonesia, and uh, Argentina, and Peru, and places like that, Chile, uh, where if the trees grow quicker and the labor costs are lower. So Finland has to find a new trajectory for its business, and so this could be it. Now, in order to enable the building to get built, though, in timber, to then suggest to the industry that construction material could be a viable future for the finished forestry business, we had to rework the fire codes, because the fire codes in Helsinki said, you can't build a building that big out of timber, because when they were written was the 19th century, and if you did build a building that big out of timber, it would burn down. So they said, don't do that. And then we had to reach into, basically, the, the heart of government legislation and tweak the fire code to enable the building to get built. Now, that really seems like a small change, but absolutely fundamental. It's not something that a developer could probably do, even though developers are our partners on these projects. If a developer did try and do it, they'd probably do it as an exception, so that they could steal a march on the market, rather than change the whole, 
rather than change the whole uh, legislation so that other developers could follow across the country, they'd um, really just try and move ahead and say, I just want to build this building here. And so exceptions are quite easy from a legislative point of view. You don't have to change the law at core, but they don't enable systemic change. They don't enable other people to follow. So we wanted to do this kind of fundamentally, if you like, change the fire code so that others could follow. And now we're building the building. Two more buildings have been announced from this, our developer partner that are also timber, one in Helsinki and one in Tampere, actually, which is another city in, in Finland. So what we call this kind of stuff is uh, dark matter. So, um, and this comes from this Dutch urban planner. And he says, if you really want to change the city, yada, 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 You've got to really deal with uh, the structures and institutions. That's where the real struggles are, the horribly complex dark matter. That's where it becomes really interesting. So he's, just before you think dark matter is a pejorative term, it's a proper term from actual physics, right? <laughs> it's not really pejorative, it just is what it is. So ignore the dark bit, if you like. It just means uh, everything that we can't see that enables the thing to be produced. So dark matter in a physics context cannot be perceived it's all around us. It's 83% of the known universe, which is frankly unbelievable. Um, Do you have a quick time check? How are we going? Because we probably need to. All right. Open up where you're in five minutes, if you can. Uh, a bit more. I'll give you seven. So, 83% um, of the known universe is. I've just gone into physics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like. My favourite. So, a long time ago, the Big Bang. No. Uh, no one's ever seen it, and yet it, you can only perceive it through its effects on things. So we only know dark matter exists because of the matter. So we only know, for instance, that, so this matter is produced from an organizational context, a cultural context, a legislative context, a, a practice, and so on. And that's all the dark matter stuff. You can't see the iPhone is an object. You can't really perceive the way that Apple that makes it, the, its organization, its lawyers, its designers, and so on, its logistics networks. But all of that is there that enables the iPhone. So this dark matter idea is core to us now. Being able to manipulate that is what, how you make something systemic. It's always easy to do the intervention, the installation, if you like, the one-off, the exception. But to make something ex um, systemic, that requires engaging with the dark matter. Another thing, so MacGuffin <laughs> is a funny phrase. So this other concept, the MacGuffin, it comes from Alfred Hitchcock, and maybe I'll let him describe it because he's Alfred Hitchcock. Um, he talks about it's the thing that the characters on the screen care about, but the audience don't care. So in North by Northwest, those of you who know that, that movie, it was this idea of the, there were some secret government plans which kicks the whole movie off. No one ever gets anywhere near them. They're really barely mentioned again, but all of the characters are driven by that. It's the absolute motivation. The audience doesn't really care about it. They just care about the characters. Uh, it's the mechanical element that crops up in a story. Now, for us, low to know, the building is the MacGuffin. It's the thing that drives people through. We wouldn't be able to get timber construction going in Finland with a PowerPoint slide as good as that PowerPoint slide might be, or a convincing presentation, or a pitch. You have to build the thing. You have to make something to give people the motivation to actually change the fire codes. It's not enough just to say, you know what, we it wouldn't be nice if we had timber buildings everywhere, and perhaps we could tweak that fire code. It just doesn't happen. If you're building a building, however, and you make that happen, you drive the motivation, you drive the plot, the narrative, if you like. A MacGuffin you see in close film about spies. This is a thing spies are after. In the days of Rudyard Kipling, it would be the plans of the fort on the Kuiper Pass. It would be the plans of an airplane in war. And the plans uh, of an atom bomb. And it didn't be right. It's always called the thing that the characters on the screen worry about, but the audience don't care. Uh, Montgomery Oops. That's enough, Alfred. <laughs> so, it's a, so the reason, again, with vocabulary, if you're working on a project or a, or a process or an idea, what might be the MacGuffin? What's the thing that's actually going to drive the motivation to get the thing done? And that might be entirely separate to the strategic intent, what you want to have happen, come out of it. But you've got to give people a reason to get behind something. And so building projects are quite good because they have this ridiculous momentum once they get going because of the amount of sunk investment, the physical matter, the complexity of doing something like that. So if you start off with that, you've actually got to follow it through and make sure you're going to get 
uh, as much strategic or systemic change out of it as possible. Another thing, so uh, with low to no, we're also looking at food culture in Helsinki and how that can change. So food culture in Helsinki has changed quite a lot recently. It used to be dreadful, I have to say. Uh, and I say that in the sense that it was also dreadful in England and most of Northern Europe. Um, but now it's changed in recent years, so there are organic delis and things like that. There's this great thing called the Camionettes, which is selling crepes to the street. There's this lovely day called <coughs> Ravintala Paiva, and Ravintala means restaurant, and that means day. So uh, this is pop-up restaurant day that actually Michelle saw when she was in Helsinki. So these pop-up kitchens can exist for this one day. They're kind of outside of regulation. This was a Thai kitchen place just in parks. There's about 200 of them spring up, and then they, they go again. So that's all going on. Um, but how do you actually make that happen? Gets back to dark matter again on a more systemic change, because food culture in Helsinki is also this. <laughs> these, are, these are drunk people, <laughs> just before you really worry about them. Um, this is something an artist did, which is you know, the idea of greeting cards from Helsinki, so uh, in that sort of style. <laughs> Well, he went around and took those kinds of pictures <laughs> and he made these postcards and put them around the city. So you, you do see this. We, we commissioned a photographer to take these pictures late at night. This is the Grilly, which is the archetypal kind of hot dog stand. And it's the only thing that you can really get a license for from the government in terms of street food. It's that or ice cream stands, basically. So these Grilly are kind of nice at the start of the evening, but by the end of the evening they turn into these horror shows selling these unbelievable things, which... <laughs> Like this, I don't know what this is. It's sausage, there's potato, there's... That's actual size as well. No, it's, it's not. Um, I mean, they're just... <laughs> they are grotesque, you know. You can't tell whether people are throwing it up or eating it. I don't know, it's just... Anyway, so you get the gist. So the impact, the footprint of these things in terms of litter, in terms of drunken behaviour and violence is, is quite, quite a lot. Um, so, so Helsinki is a very beautiful city, but often if you get up early enough on a Saturday morning, you'll see just the streets are covered with detritus from the night before because the street food leads it in that direction. It's oriented towards drunk people and the kind of stuff that they want. <coughs> so uh, my colleague Brian just made a map actually last night, so this is hot off the press. These are, these are restaurant opening hours, and this is drunken behaviour. <laughs> And you see there's not much overlap. So this is hence the grilly. There's no place to really kind of drink, um, say, from about 9 o'clock. Well, this is even 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Things start shutting down. It's that kind of culture. And, but then people are drinking through to here, but they're drinking to excess in a way. So th there's no sense of kind of slow drink to go with food. It's all about... Anyway, you get the gist again. But it's, so we're trying to unpick this a little bit. Uh, there, is a, there is a tradition of street food here. These are, this is from the Baltic Herring Fair, which is selling off the back of boats in the harbour, which is fantastic, but only works for one week. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Now, the problem there is that the Grilly licensing is, has a 10-year lease. So you take out a lease on that every 10 years, and then they're just there for 10 years. So in street food, that's a very long time. <laughs> There's all kinds of things come and go over that cycle, but there's no way you can open anything up because they only auction the leases every, every decade. So we're trying to change that as well. We're looking at informatics stuff, smart systems, these kind of, this is all to do with low to no again that we're, we're pushing in there. So mobile based things, these would be, um, this is done by Experientia in Turin. There are partners on the project. So these are sort of smart energy bills essentially delivered over mobile and web. Uh, it also sit in your living room, in your house, then there's all the stuff I showed you earlier is happening. I'll skip through those. Um, we're looking at participative design going on in this. We're looking at tenancy innovation within the system. We're looking at building repair culture into it. So I'm just trying to get across here the Trojan horseness of the project. The, the stuff that we're looking at around the way the building actually works and lives and then the changes you might be able to make to either street food or repair culture or the systems of living and working within the space are being considered as part of the design challenge. So, in that sense, we're looking at matter, physical matter, to unlock the meta stuff. All of these wider things around street food and stuff, is that's all meta. How do you spread that across Helsinki, Finland? Meta. The physical building is matter. You can go the other way, and there's a great project here in Australia, which many of you will know, called Renew Newcastle, which is, I'd say, is meta unlocking matter in that um, Newcastle CBD was 
had about 200, 200 buildings, I think, were unused in it, um, maybe two, three years ago, when Marcus Westbury and a couple of colleagues started this Renew Newcastle project. And now they've taken a huge number of those buildings and transformed them into these kinds of spaces by getting people in to set up small businesses or cooperatives or artist studios and so on. And the way that they did that was just by changing the leasing structure alone. So they enabled a rolling 30-day lease to happen in exactly the same spaces as opposed to the normal two, three-year lease. Again, the innovation cycle tied to the buildings was too long, and that was a dark matter thing. That was just legislation. There was nothing else going on there. So Marcus and others brokered a deal, essentially, with the building owners saying, what about a 30-day lease? Because we've got people that could move in tomorrow, but they can only sign up to 30 days. They don't have the capital to go for two years. But you can renew it every 30 days. So the artist moves in, or the small business moves in, and then they re-sign on day 29, and it goes, and it goes, and it goes, and it goes. So the place is now active. Uh, there are, I think there are 60-odd buildings now occupied and thriving, genuinely thriving. There are events and so on. So I'd say that's matter. That is literally just a stroke of paperwork changing physical matter. There was no money spent on the physical regeneration, essentially, from the state or the feds or anybody in that space or from Marcus. It was all actually just agreeing at a different legislat legislative agreement. That's all. It's just brokering a different deal. But you have to design with that zoom in mind between meta and matter. Understand you're working at both levels. That's the difference in this strategic design. So a Finnish architect said a long time ago in the early 20th century, always design a thing by considering it in its next larger context. A chair in a room, a room in a house, a house in an environment, environment in a city plan, and so on. So always be aware of that potential wider impact of what you're doing. And we think you can go the other way as well. Design the context by considering the thing it's intended to, produ to produce. So you have to redesign the organization to produce a transformative product or service. You can't get the same thing. Sorry, you can't get a different thing out of the same organization. It's oriented in a different direction. So another idea here, the platform also applies to low to now. All that smart system stuff can also move into another block, and another block, and another block. The timber becomes actually something that can move across an entire nation, potentially. So this is a, an idea from the web, actually. The web is driven by platform thinking now, and it's how it gets those network effects and that incredible scaling so quickly. And there are ways that you design those kinds of systems. Uh, final concept, and then we'll, we'll, I'll move into the wrapping up. <laughs> um, Maginot Line. So those of you that know your military history will know that the Maginot Line was not France's finest moment. Um, <laughs> They spent many, many years and millions and millions of, I, I would guess now, um, dollars building fortifications in order to prevent what happened in World War I happening again and built this incredible structure across its borders so that Germany couldn't just march uh, into its borders. And of course, Germany just went around it. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's one of the great problems in strategy, actually, now. And there's this great line about generals always fight the last war, particularly if they won it. And uh, that's what happened here. The French generals were thinking about World War I and the mechanized I infantry that went along with that. And they can sort of missed the whole point of air forces and um, advances in the 30 years since. And so the Germans went around the thing. You can still see bits of the Maginot Line in France. There's a French flag looking rather disconsolate there, as it should do. Um, so it still exists because it's, it's just so deeply embedded into the country. But again, they just went around it. So. This is an interesting tactic to use strategically on a project. So we worked on a project here, uh, which the Australian Commonwealth put out, a framework for community engagement strategy for the built environment. Basically, the brief was to tell us why people aren't buying sustainable homes. So do some community engagement work and try and figure that one out, and then work with the industry to try and solve that. And we went a different way with that. Actually, we won the brief, but we decided instead to go around the industry by building um, a proposal for a TV show. Instead, a reality TV show along the lines of MasterChef, which you know has these kinds of effects whenever it runs um, in terms of the impact that it can have on the way that people behave. This is, the, this is the next day after these ingredients were featured on the show the night before. And this is during the course of uh, it running. So you can change the way that people behave. I know that's a scary thing to say, but in the world of media and marketing, that's what they do every single day. That's their job. They're driven by that. And it's very uncomfortable when we're in public sector to think in those terms. And I'm not saying we just adopt that and deploy. But still, it's an idea that you can actually be much more interventionist, if you like, in the way that the market 
behaves. You could call it market design, or you can talk about behavior change, or they're two different things, but they're, they're all in that sort of space. So we came up with the idea of the TV show. And that was really because the industry, the built environment industry, which is one of the least innovative industries ever, according to the Harvard Business Review, um, essentially works on its perception of the market. So if you think about this is a random scale of sustainability-ness. And so they're sort of down there because they think the market's down there. They think that Australians aren't going to buy um, apartments. Jane Francis has a report on this matter that she can publish to publish yesterday to tell you all about why this isn't a way of fixing it. But, but this is where it's very closely tied. Now, you can argue whether their perception of the market is right, which I think is some of the interesting stuff in the Grattan work, is that Australians do actually want a wider range of choice than the industry is giving them. But that, again, shows a breakdown. There's some perception problem. <coughs> Either way, we thought, well, why don't we actually just change the perception of the market? So change the way what the market is asking for. And you, the industry just has to follow. Because it's a very simple beast. It's just tied to that perception. So if you can actually do that, you're kind of going around the industry to the market directly. And then you pull the industry with the change there. And that was just a very simple trick that I think got us that gig with the, uh, the government here. Um, and it was, it, I think it was a very different approach to the one that they started the project with, put it that way. And then finally, this project in Chile by Elemental around social housing. Now, in Chile, you have to make, you have to make a house for $11,000 <laughs> in a social housing context. That's everything. Construction, design fees, the cost of buying the land, everything is in that $11,000. It's kind of, a, there's not a lot of money, but that's the social housing subsidy that the government gives you. So a strategy to approach that, you'd think, might be to try and get at that social housing subsidy and say, about 11,000, that's not enough. That's, that should be 30,000, should be 40,000, or whatever. It should be an awful lot more. <coughs> what Ellen Mental did instead was design a building that could change and grow and increase in value over time. So their approach was to, set, instead of taking the $11,000 and trying to make the best house you could for that, they said, let's build half the house. So we'll spend more money on the land, but we'll only build half a house. But that half will kind of work fine and actually enables people to move in and then actually build the rest of it so that it increases in value over time. Because the problem was they were spending so much money on the house, they weren't spending enough on the land, and so the housing was in an unpromising position way outside the city, and so it didn't increase in value over time. They couldn't take any advantage of that market effect. Their solution enabled it to move it closer to the city and increase in value and enable the basically room for change. So their, their housing to begin with looks, this is pre-final uh, design, but it kind of looks like this. And then people start building in the gaps in between. So you saw there were gaps there before, and they started actually adding to it. So first of all, that enables people to build something that they want. So you get a vernacular kind of adaptive thing going on. Uh, but it means you can build this bit with high quality as well instead of trying to keep the cost low. They've done the same thing. So you actually get this very interesting patterning now. It's, 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 it's a very different approach to social housing in general. So I'd say what they were doing is using the property value over time to actually go around the subsidy again, and sort of imagine you know, lining it out of the way. In Mexico, they've also done this. Traditionally, they would spend 66% of the, the fee on the building and 33% on the land. And Elemental got them to understand that you could spend actually 80% on the land, so buy it in a good position but we'll only build half the building, so we only need 20% of the money. And the building value will fill in the rest over time. And so again, this is their, these are their buildings in Mexico. It's actually one big building, <coughs> although it looks again like it could carry lots of individual elements within it. So you get, the best, you get the best of building one building and the consistency, but you also get the patterning that enables people to adapt it. So finally, um, where does this leave Finland? Uh, We've been talking a lot about cultures of decision making. How do you change a culture of decision making? So in the Nordic model, if you like, and there are books about this, if you took it Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, you get this very, very high performing system, but quite a narrow range of experience, if you like. And that's partly because it's quite a homogenous culture. So Finland is only 3% foreign born. Uh, let's see, Helsinki is about 6 or 7% no, 7 now. And Sydney is probably about 33% foreign born, I suspect. You know, so it's radically different. So the, the range of experience is quite narrow in a sense. Because the ideas around equity and fairness that are locked into the idea of the way the system should work, everybody gets free public education, everybody gets free public health care, and so on. And you kind of all get the same standard. It's, it's incredibly high. They have the best education system in the world. 
South Korea occasionally best. You know, they're one and two for numeracy, literacy, and all of those things. So, so they get extraordinarily high performance out of a public, free public education system. But it's partly, critics would say, because of the homogenous culture that enables you to do that. So you get a very high, but it's kind of got a narrow range. Again, you'd say the street food is like this. It's all hot dogs all the way. <laughs> uh, and actually, it would be lower in that sense, obviously, in terms of quality. Um, but income inequality, income equality is very, very close to each other. So you basically earn what your boss earns and what your, their boss earns and so on, more or less. It's one of the closest, um, although it's been changing in the last couple of years, it's the income equality is so strong compared to, say, Australia, US, UK, where it's been going the other way. So speaking of which, you'd say the Anglo model, if you like. So let's talk broadly about Australia, UK, US. Let's talk about the US because it's safer. Um, is a pattern more like this. You get peaks of innovation, peaks of high achievement, brilliance. Let's say, let's just plonk Harvard up there for the sake of argument. But you also get very, very low. You get complete dropout. You get no welfare state, no safety net, very low quality public education. Um, food, you get incredible innovation and the absolute dross and so on and so on. These are broad generalizations and obviously diagrammatic. But you see what I mean about this kind of range that you get, but then massive inequality as well across the range. So comparing those two systems is kind of interesting when you think about, all right, there's those different ways of thinking about stuff. So we've got the spirit level approach, which produces high but narrow. And then you've got the Anglo approach, which is incredibly diverse and produces peaks of innovation and peaks of incredibly high salary, and then very low median level for most people though. So the challenge surely would be for the Nordic model is to get a bit of both, to retain the high baseline but to build in the spikes of innovation above it. That is what we're trying to get at with our work at Citra now. It says, could you make an augmented Nordic, augmented Nordic model, sorry, augmented Nordic model, uh, which, that's the jet lag coming, which enables you to absorb diversity into the system because Finland is getting more diverse. And so that system is under challenge all the time. Can you do free public healthcare? Can you do free public education at that quality level? when you've got a diverse population. No one's really managed to pull that one off yet. So this is where we try and position our work now in this idea of how a system might absorb diversity. So with the food example, which we're working on a lot, how do you take that spike of innovation, but then also link it to a system which has the daycare system in it, which is the kindergarten. That's daycare in Finnish. Uh, where you get free hot food every day across the entire city. So if you send your kid to daycare there, they get uh, free hot meals. And it means that Helsinki is the biggest kitchen, sorry, the city is the biggest kitchen in Helsinki. It's the single biggest player. It makes hundreds of thousands of meals a day. So it's got this very broad capacity at this level. It can decide to say, let's have all organic food served to all our kids by 2016. And actually, this is half of them by 2014, because it can pull that lever because it's making all the food. You couldn't do that here. You couldn't say in Australia, or in Sydney, I want 50% of all kids at kindergarten age to have organic food. How are you gonna do it? Write a letter to the parents? I mean, it's, you know, they'd get, because they're making sandwiches for them. They, they, you know, you'd get sued, probably. So, so this, is, this is a very different lever you can pull here, but it's disconnected from that system. So we're trying to connect these two together to say, how could you take the innovation here and actually see it as part of the same system that produces the food scale on that level to produce an innovation system that works across two. So you get instance of brilliance and then systemic change via the dark matter. So this is this point. The intervention of the easy bit, the ideas of the easy bit, the systemic change bit is tough. How do you generate the spikes of innovation yet retaining the levers to make things happen? So how do you be entrepreneurial and connect policy together without giving up strong policy? Part of that is dark matter. Part of that is being embedded within government and policy. So our, our work in the next year, we're placing designers into these ministries in the national government and in the city government. Strategic designers are going in to sit in those contexts and work on projects. Um, and we, this is quite core. Cool. This isn't about basically getting falafels where previously they were just hot dogs. <laughs> this is about this idea about the next Nordic model. How do you absorb the diversity? because it's the one that's system that's most adaptable to change that survives, as biologists would say. And actually a system that's in constancy is fragile, too fragile. 
so this leads to resilience. Resilience is a measure of a system's ability to survive and persist. And we could actually see these are the Brisbane floods last year. That's a, that's a non-resilient system in action, a very brittle system. And that's because of the constancy which has uh, driven the way that that environment works and the way that that culture works. So I've talked about six different techniques here, maybe six new words. Um, and uh, because I worked on Monocle, I can't do anything without having a top five blah about blah. <laughs> so my top five half-formed thoughts to finish on. The world is mutable. So this is another design thing. As, as Martin said, I think, right at the start, we tend to see the world as things that have been designed and therefore can be redesigned. Or they can, they can be changed in some way. Everything around us is the result of a design decision. Everything in this room, everything in this city is basically is a result of a series of decisions, pretty much. Possibly except the green for leafy bits. So we can make different decisions about those things. And that isn't something that naturally occurs all the time in policy where you're stuck with this idea about path dependency. But Jonathan Ive talks about this a bit. The way that you look at the world, and um, I guess it's one of the sort of curses of what you do is that you're constantly looking at something and thinking, why, why, why is it like that? Or why is it like that and not like this? I love the pained expression on his face. He must, must be horrible for, he's, say, de, he's the lead designer at Apple, so he designs the iPod and the iPad and all of that. Imagine walking around being him looking at the world, but anyway. <laughs> um, Philip Colligan, who works at Nestor in the UK, talks about public service, and policymakers and managers are taking design decisions all the time, <laughs> but without realizing it often. So first of all, we stop and think, I think, we are making these decisions. How could we design them instead? And what does design even mean in that context? How do we prototype public service and take on these ideas about optimism and risk and ambiguity, if you like, that again we talked about earlier. So Obama didn't get elected on, yes, we'll try. <laughs> he said, yes, we can. But in reality, it is, yes, we will try. And so how do we understand political capital and its need to be decisive and to have a clear course of action and deliver? And yet the reality is that we are trying stuff the whole time. I mean, Obama probably should have said, you know what, we'll give it our best shot, and we'll probably fail to begin with it. We'll try again, and then it'll be all right, and then it'll get better over time, and we'll see how it goes. You know, so if that's the reality of what's actually going on. And actually, that would be a more positive thing to say, because it recognizes that we, we, we can iterate our way towards better scenarios. It's incredibly hard for a politician to say that. He has to say, yes, we can. So how do we connect political capital in the world, the way that that works, to this idea of prototyping and resist, risk and optimism and so on? Part of that is strategic intent, being clear about that and prototyping, which I won't go into now. But part of this is also understanding design isn't about problem solving. My friend Jack says, you know, designers do solve problems, but then so do dentists. So there's nothing kind of intrinsically designery about solving a problem. Uh, what design is really about is cultural invention. It's about suggesting another way of doing, another way of being, another kind of world. And that could be incredibly useful within policy. Within venture capital, and this guy's actually now head of the MIT Media Lab, Joey Ito, he talks about the, in venture capital now the cost of assessing a risk is now often greater than the cost of failing. So they've actually stopped doing a lot of the risk assessment there, and they're now actually just trying things and then uh, pivoting, moving, constantly trying and trying and pivoting and moving. And, and that's the word, pivot is the biggest word in venture capital at the moment. And you're actually trying to force failure into those systems to build resilience. That's a totally different vocabulary and instinct, again, to public sector culture for obvious reasons. You don't want to force failure within a hospital context, so we understand that. But there are other contexts around that that you might do that. So hinge policy and delivery together through stewardship. I've talked a bit about that. And design for scale, system, and platform, the idea that things should be replicable, not just doing one-offs, not just doing the one building project there. Don't just do Barangaroo until it gives you the entire DNA for how all of Sydney should develop over the next 50 years. And finally, matter matters. Physical matter matters, but also dark matter. So unless you're looking at the dark matter, the organizational, the cultural, the legislative, all of those things, that's when you, you can't unlock the systemic change. So you have to make the thing, and you have to take into Wouter's words into account about dark matter. And that, finally, is where I'll leave it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>